Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. It's a podcast about Gnosticism, the impact of Gnosticism on society, esotericism, mysticism, philosophy, and whatever I'm interested in this week. Uh, we've got a really special, awesome show for you. I hope I say your name right. We've got Dr. Agata Bielik Robson. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Uh, the author of uh, one of the most brilliant uh, pieces I've ever read, uh, Solid Hatred Addressed to Being, Lacan's Gnostic Use of Judaism. Uh, I literally, uh, I was gobsmacked by it. Uh, I read it, and it's one of the few times that I, I read it beginning to end, and then immediately picked the book back up and read it again, because I, I got so much out of it and enjoyed it so much. So it's it's a real uh, pleasure and honor to have you on here to talk about that piece and kind of talk about Lacan and Gnosticism and Judaism and whatever else we can we can fit in in, in the in the time we have. Um, so so we we actually have a, a fair amount to cover. So I'll, I'll probably just uh, jump right into it. And I forgot to say you're a professor of Jewish studies uh, at the Department of Theolo Theology and Religious Studies at University of Nottingham. I'll, I'll also link up some uh, uh, of the other books and pieces that you've written in our show notes because uh, I know our audience will want to explore your work. So that said, I'm going to jump right into it. Agatha. Thank you, can, Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you unpack? And, and again, these are all really big questions. We ask big questions on this show. Uh, can you unpack the solid hatred addressed to being and how it shows up in Lacan? And, and maybe if you could explain a little bit about what it has to do with the other and, and the symbolic order. Well, uh, the very concept, solid hatred, addressed to being, appears in the 20th seminar of Jacques Lacan, which is called Encore, and is devoted to feminine love. And we definitely are going to talk about it later on, but also has this whole section discussing Judaism as the first monotheism. And uh, it is in this section where Lacan suggests uh, that actually Judaism, uh, which on the surface seems to be a kind of a religion of love for creation, a love for the God who creates the world as it is, and is a kind of a general religion of affirmation of the worldly existence, actually harbors this hidden dimension, a Gnostic dimension of solid hatred addressed to be. Uh, but before we talk about Judaism and the solid hatred, I'll try to explain why Lacan is so interested in it. Yes. Uh, he claims that in the history of the Western thought, uh, we, uh, the thinking mankind, are a little bit blind or, or perhaps deliberately blind or, as he says, deaf mm -hmm. to the issue of hatred that actual being, uh, uh, that actual being uh, um, evokes in us. Uh, that we tend to somehow cover it uh, with the sentiments of love, of affirmation, uh, that make it, make it easier to adjust ourselves uh, to the existence that it is, to the status quo of the world. Uh, while in fact, all the time we repress a kind of a, uh, a very solid, uh, that means intense, no, a negation uh, that we throw towards the world. And in his psychoanalysis, Lacan claims to uh, make this hatred more visible. He actually thinks that once we reconcile ourselves with this solid hatred addressed to being as the repressed sentiment towards our existence in the world it is the beginning of the therapy yes it is the beginning of the therapy so it is not exactly a therapy through uh what uh, the christians would call love uh love is here a very complicated reverse of what comes as the first and what seemed to be so repressed for at least two millennia, that is hatred. Hatred to general, to everything that exists. Now, what does it mean for Lacan? Uh, for Lacan, it is very important to distinguish between the two registers of existence. One that is called being, 
and it is actually connected with language and what we call uh, the symbolic order. A being or order of reality, a little bit like Kant, it is the order of appearances. That is the real or reality as constituted by our uh, cognitive means, most of all language. This is what Lacan calls par lettre, that is being organized by language, uh, which is a kind of exact uh, psychoanalytic version of the Kantian uh, reality of appearances, phenomenal reality. On the other hand, there is this mysterious real, uh, which cannot be articulated in a sort of direct expression of speaking, of language, which lies beyond the phenomenal constitution, as Kant would say, uh, but it is the only reality worth living. But this reality, the real, réel, cannot be accessed uh, via par lettre. It is actually completely opposed to it. Uh, Lacan plays often with the Freudian concept of das Ding that originally addressed itself to this more real register of uh, our existence, um, which obviously also hides the Kantian Ding and sich, the thing in itself. Uh, uh, so, in a way, psychoanalysis, Lacanian psychoanalysis is a very philosophical way of approaching the kind of a modern dilemma that is how real is the real uh, we uh, in the world in which we live what is the mere phenomenal reality are there the nomina that is the things in themselves behind how do we access the real real for the lacan the way to access the real real is to by a destruction of the symbolic order, of the symbolic order, which uh, decides about the order of being. So uh, what he calls love for the real can only come forward as uh, a consequence of the hatred for being as constructed by Barlet. That is this order of speaking or order of the uh, phenomenal constitution of the world. And there is obviously uh, another dimension here, which is absent from Kant and much closer to the Gnostic thought, namely uh, the other. It is the other written with the big O who's responsible for the construction organization of being as par lettre. That is this being that is reinforced by the act of speaking, the act of language, by the symbolic order. Uh, it is the other to which we be begin to belong once we begin to speak. The initiation into the language is the beginning of the absolute dependence on the other. From this time on, uh, the real, as my real, as my pound of flesh, as Lacan calls it, by uh, using the, the phrase coming from Shakespeare's Shylock, right? my pound of flesh completely disappears for the sake of, well, a false spectacle of being that exists only as spoken, that is, as coming into existence by uh, the whole system organized by the Archon. Of course, the Lac Lacan does not call the other Lotrui an Archon, but actually there is a hint, and he sometimes makes a suggestion that the uh, uh, letter A, big A, which he uses for big other, can also be understood as Lachon. The, the arc. So, <clears throat> solid hatred addressed to being is, in Gnostic terms, a solid hatred addressed to the other, who 
expropriates us from our real real, our real body, our real pound of the flesh, and the true joy that is connected to the fact of being just me, right? Before before entering into any relation and 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 trying to reconnect with this realness that's been forever lost in this world of the dependence on the other and the symbolic forms which he creates I think even before you you connected the two, a lot of people who are listening and watching, regular fans, people who have an interest in Gnosticism, maybe this is their first time they've ever watched the show, uh, they already started making those connections. And it seems so obvious to me, though though I have a confession. I've recently gone back to school to, to study Lacan and continental philosophy, and I felt drawn to these topics. But originally, I wanted to, to get away from Gnosticism in a way. You know, it's something I've been immersed in for a decade, doing a lot of para-academic work on Gnosticism. And, you know, I wanted to expand my horizons. And then as I started to, to jump into the stuff, really dwell dwell to really inhabit it it's it, I, it's oh my god it's it's gnosticism you know hegel it's gnosticism lacan it's gnosticism okay. <laughs> i can't get away from it um and and i think you know the explanation that you just said anybody who's familiar with this stuff it, it becomes obvious right away and and i and i kind of wish these these connections were perhaps more obvious to to other people as well though there is quite a lot of work you know kind of connecting kabbalah and particularly the more Gnostic forms of, of, of Kabbalistic thought, like Isaac Luria, to the continental philosoph uh, philosophical traditions, to Lacan. So it, it is it is out there, just not specifically uh, Gnosticism. But okay, so you mentioned that solid hatred addressed to being can only emerge in monotheism, and therefore within the first monotheism, Judaism. Can you can you explain that to us? Why? What's the connection between those two? Well, it is obviously connected with the idea of God the Creator. Uh, and again, on the surface, Judaism uh, is this kind of affirmation of the creative work of God, uh, who uh, in six days, uh, in six days or perhaps by other means, uh, made this world the way it is. Uh, uh, we know, for instance, that Arthur Schopenhauer, Oh, yet another Gnostic <laughs> you haven't mentioned, who actually very strongly influenced uh, the founding father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, and obviously uh, um, indirectly Lacan. He actually talks about Schopenhauer quite a lot with you know a lot of sympathy. Uh, it was Schopenhauer uh, who 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 first accused Judaism of actually being, not first, but yeah, he accused Judaism of being this uh, naive uh, religion of God the Creator uh, that wants us to affirm right, everything uh, that God made in the world, right, and never utter the voice of protest. Uh, I said first, but then I hesitated, obviously it was just a first in modernity, but actually this is a kind of a steady accusation that comes from the Gnostic side, uh, most of all Marcion, the second century Christian Gnostic, who famously uh, divided uh, Old Testament and New Testament by saying that they have absolutely nothing in common. Uh, the Hebrew Bible is this absolutely erroneous, erroneous uh, uh, praise of God the Creator, uh, who's actually an evil archon, whereas it is the, young, the New Testament actually inaugurates a completely new religion, a Gnostic Christianity focused on God the Redeemer, uh, who's actually to redeem us, uh, the alien God who comes to redeem us from the snares and traps that are set by Jehovah, the God Creator. But this is a kind of a view, I mean, it's kind of a standard accusation of monotheism as always affirming creation. Uh, it's actually wrong. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, Judaism, I'm speaking only here about the paradigmatic monotheism, 
is incredibly ambivalent on this issue. And this is precisely what Lacan uh, points at by saying that this apparent love for creation hides a secret dimension of a solid hatred addressed to being where God as creator is simultaneously an object of a cultic praise and accusation, accusation. Because finally there is someone, something, uh, one personal principle that can be pointed at uh, as the one who's responsible for the totality of being. And this is precisely this responsibility and personal responsibility that somehow also involves an intention that can be accused of going awry or being wrong, being cruel, being evil, whatever. When you read the book of Job, you see that it is actually a kind of a first document within the Hebrew Bible and very old, right, on top of that. One of the oldest that actually, you know, create the canon, the Hebrew canon. It is the document of the Hebrew Bible in which this accusation comes to the fore most, most strongly. It wouldn't be possible in the pagan universe with the whole pleroma of gods only responsible for small or like a local regions of reality. Uh, also, there is absolutely no sense like in a Greek tragedy to address accusation to the impersonal fate, right? Moira, Ananke, however you call it, is some kind of an impersonal principle that just runs everything, but it would be pointless, right? To voice any protest against it. So this is why in the Greek tragedy, usually the hero goes very silent because he confronts the fate and can't really speak a word against it. It's very different with Job, who at the beginning indeed falls completely silent and keeps mute for about seven days, but then suddenly breaks into this enormous lament, something that the Hebrew tradition calls kina, a lamentation, which only Judaism knows as the monotheistic religion that finally found uh, the personal God, the personal principle responsible for all this. So all this lamentation is an accusation, right? Uh, Klagen is the Klagen, as Gershom Scholem used to connect these two terms, right? Which in German means that to lament means to accuse. And indeed in Gershom Scholem's analysis of Judaism, uh, where the book of Job becomes central, uh, he also claims that Judaism, precisely because it is the first monotheism, it is also Gnostic. And he says that the very essence of Judaism is actually Jewish Nazis. That is a constant wrestling with God. Uh, Israel, after all, means wrestling with God. The job and wrestling with God in which the creature routinely accuses the creator for everything that goes wrong in the world. Because it's like in a criminal novel, right? Ernst Bloch once wrote that Judaism is like a criminal novel, right? It's who done it. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually that the world can also be understood as a one huge crime that needs to be solved. Uh, very Gnostic idea that, that solved by pointing to the one who's truly responsible for it and because of that can be accused in a job and lament. Yeah. So in a way it is in a way paradigmatically Gnostic isn't it? Right? 
extremely so. And, and you sort of answered my next question, which I'm not going to ask, but I'm just going to to reiterate and highlight some of what you're speaking about. But there's there's a dominant scholarly trend right now, and, and I mean trend in the colloquial term, um, to say that the Gnosticism is a second century Christian development, and you need Plato, and you need all these interactions of other cultures, and uh, where previous generations said, okay, it comes, it comes out of Judaism, or I, I don't necessarily like saying Judaism for pre-Second Temple religion, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I think you've made uh, explicit that, that we can find it in, in the very depths uh, in the oldest texts. And, and for those uh, who don't know, uh, even though, of course, the, the Tanakh, the, the, the Hebrew Bible starts with Genesis, the, as, as uh, Agatha said, one of the oldest books is actually Job. So we have it there in, in, in the very DNA. And, and I can see, too, you know, just reading Genesis, like the Gnostics were obsessed with Genesis, right? If you're left alone in a cave of that book, well, you have two creation stories, um, uh, the, with the binding of Isaac, it's uh, it's Elohim who tells who, who tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but it's Yahweh who uh, who tells him not to at the very end. And we also have all this this commentary that that I think a lot of people with Christian backgrounds are are not familiar with, right? You know, we if you went to Sunday school and you have a Christian background, you know, you're taught the Abraham and Isaac story as, as Abraham's uh, uh, supreme devotion to God and how great it was that he was willing to sacrifice his son, where you have a lot of rabbinic and, and other commentary that was like, no, you know, this was awful. A Abraham screwed up, right? More accusations of God. And this is relatively mainstream in, in the Jewish traditions. So I, I, I really do agree with you that Gnostic thought is, is, very central to, to Judaism, very central to all of these religious currents that, that are coming out of Palestine for the last thousands and thousands of years. But I, I want to transition to my next question, which is, what is the subterranean Bible and the wisdom of the serpent? Okay, so here we are uh, entering to the sort of next phase of Gnosticizing Judaism. Uh, I already mentioned Gershom Sholem. Um, who uh, um, actually got in a big quarrel uh, with other uh, philosophers of Judaism, like Hans Jonas, uh, by claiming that not only Judaism, uh, Judaism in essence is a Jewish Nazis, but as you now said, practically the whole Gnostic current now attributed to the second century uh, century Christianity uh, was actually like fermenting already uh, within the within the pre rabbinic uh, uh, Judaic thought, uh, with obviously uh, all the Essenes, the Mandeans, the Mandeans who are favorite of Jacob Taubes, also insisting on the Gnostic element uh, within Judaism, and obviously the Christians themselves. Uh, that started uh, according to, for instance, Taubes or Bloch again as Christian Gnostics. And only then stabilized around the fourth century as more like a church or religion oriented towards the world. Uh, but Hans Jonas uh, actually claimed that uh, Judaism. Uh, because it is the religion of creation, cannot ever be Gnostic. So I mentioned this because it again sort of reflects a kind of a, uh, a kind of a very uh, internal ambivalence of the monotheistic faith. It can be Judaism, can be Christianity, Islam, doesn't matter. Abrahamic monotheisms are deeply ambivalent and torn inside. Uh, and everything hinges on how they perceive creation. Uh, but even if there is a full affirmation of creation, just like in Hans Jonas, uh, there will always be a possibility of a doubt. And this is a kind of a, a window uh, through which a Gnostic, a possible Gnostic negation enters. Uh, so, subterranean Bible is, according to Ernst Bloch, who is just a, a, a colleague of Taubes, of Shalem, of Walter Benjamin, 
uh, of Hansianas, as all these 20th century Jews that originated in uh, what we call Weimar theology. And the Weimar theology of the 20s and the 30s was incredibly set on the Gnostic themes. It started with Adolf von Harnack's uh, Evangelium of the Alien God, which was devoted to the kind of a recall of Marcion. And then Karl Barth, the letter to the Romans, is actually a very Gnostic interpretation of Christianity, deeply influenced by the Harnackian Marcionite Gnosis. So, Perhaps it is not an accident that all those German Jews I'm talking about, uh, who were very strongly influenced by Harnack and, uh, and Barth, uh, then sort of saw within Judaism all those elements that Harnack and Barth only saw in Gnostic Christianity. The Gnostic Christianity, which on top of that, uh, was very anti-Semitic. Right? because it sort of delegated Judaism to this false religion of the, uh, of the fake god, the Archon, the Demiurge. Uh, but they somehow said, wait a minute, wait a minute, right? I mean, it doesn't start with Marcion. It doesn't start with the Pauline Christianity. It actually is already there. So, Ernst Bloch, uh, this is his aim in... Uh, the book Atheism in Christianity, to read the Hebrew Bible as the originally Gnostic document, uh, where uh, everything is, uh, it's kind of a story uh, of the interaction between the God, the creator, uh, who asserts a kind of a pharaonic power over the creation, and the serpent, who represents the forces of subversion uh, towards the, as Bloch calls it, the pharaoh of the world. And then, precisely as you uh, just said, it is also reflected in the very subtle interplay, dialectical interplay between the Elohim, who represents this uh, power of creation and that is the kind of a that is the uh, the god who represents the order of the created world and guards its status quo uh, and the tetragrammaton uh, called the yawa uh, who seems to be a different god uh, than the god of creation and calls himself God of Exodus. For Bloch, it is actually God of Exodus who cannot be easily identified with the God of creation, who is a true deity of Judaism. The Judaism understood then in a kind of a Gnostic subversive kind of manner where the Exodus out of Egypt is a kind of a paradigm of liberation of emancipation, of shedding a kind of a status quo that is uh, determined by the divine power and entering the risky desert of self-constitution or seeking true life, as Bloch would call it. So uh, in Bloch's account, the Sapturinian Bible and the wisdom of the serpent is actually the true Judaism, which cherishes the God of Exodus. And the Exodus here is understood as a kind of a Gnostic symbol of liberation, the aim of which is gaining a higher life. Yeah. Uh, and again, just to, to make, make connections explicit in, in Christian Gnosticism, in Christian esotericism, there's, there's a long tradition we find it in the Nag Hammadi texts where they're obsessed <laughs> with Exodus as a symbol, a symbol for liberation, a symbolic oh. reading of Exodus, and it comes up again and again. Um, okay, so so kind of coming back to to Lacan, coming back to psychoanalysis, the, the Gnostics are are famous for an obsession with creation myths that explain both the universe but also the creation of, of human subjectivity. And 
by understanding how creation happened, uh, salvation is through reversing this process, uh, decreational reversio. It's, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about decreational reversio? And is, is this something like psychoanalysis and, and the psychoanalytic method? Absolutely. I mean, not in the whole of psychoanalysis. I mean, we're talking here about Lacan, yes. who is a bit of a rogue uh, psychoanalyst. And I would say rogue, especially in a way that he conceives the therapy. And his version of the therapy, I said that it begins with the recognition of the solid hatred addressed <laughs> to me, right? As something, as a sentiment that we've been repressing for so long. So it begins with it, and the aim uh, of the therapy is indeed a kind of a, a variant of the Gnostic reversio. There is a kind of a regression uh, towards the symptom. Uh, that is not a kind of a state of the primary ju jouissance, which we can cannot even Remember, and in that sense, it never was, right? Because it never entered our consciousness from the very beginning, constituted by the other and the dependence on the symbolic forms organized by the other. So it is not something that we can remember. In a way, it never was. But we still uh, regress towards it uh, in a kind of a, a limit process. Uh, that eventually ends with what Lacan calls the destitution of the subject. And destitution of the subject is in a way nothing else but the decreation of the world of being uh, that is now denounced as a false spectacle and uh, a false and a kind of a botched spectacle arranged by a very failing big other. The big other, which in fact, Lacan says, does not even exist. It is a kind of an illusion that the subject constitutes or forced into being, uh, creates between one another in order to sustain themselves in this spectacle. So it is a little bit like in the uh, ancient Gnostic sects like uh, Carpocratians, right? That's what that's how they were. Carpoc yes. yep. yeah. uh, who actually believe that once we stop believing, right, in the spectacle of being, and we reach a kind of a critical mass of this belief, <laughs> actually the world will disappear because, even in, in a way, the archon has this kind of a Point de Capitan that seems to hold everything in order is also a kind of an illusion. He does not exist. The, 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 the full spectacle, in a way, even is without the author, right? It's sort of like, it is really a kind of an altruist illusion uh, that can be destroyed the moment we stop believing in. Something like that happens in, uh, in Lacan with this kind of a therapeutic regret, reg regression or reversal in which uh, something that he calls the inversion of the ladder of desire plays the crush, crucial function. Inversion of the ladder of desire is actually nothing but the Gnostic reversal. That is, uh, it is the the direction of the desire. In our, we could say, uh, normal world, uh, which Lacan tries to denounce, our desire is always directed towards the objects of the world, right? It is sort of cathected on the beings as, let's say, Big Other or the symbolic order uh, presents them to us. The whole point is to decathect, that is to unbind the desire uh, from the connection to the, the sort of strong connection with the objects and return it back to itself.
so it folds on itself on what it always wanted and which can not be represented in the symbolic order or phenomenal reality of objects that is this lost mindness the the, the this pound of flesh this real real realness that we don't even remember right but 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 we lost the moment we became colonized by language and the dependence on the other yeah. so so then desire falls on itself and it just begins to celebrate uh, this kind of the uniqueness of itself. It is no longer interested in the world. It is no longer interested even in the others because the others will belong to this world. It just circles on the symptom in which, according to Lacan, we can still hear the echoes of the real, that is, of what we were before the language colonized us. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take a break to, to quickly do our, our commercial because you can help me pay for my uh, psychoanalysis <laughs> um, <laughs> by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media. You can help keep the show going. Uh, you can help us uh, 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 pay for our time because everybody who works on the show are actually freelance artists. So we, we don't make very much money in our in our day jobs. And uh, we're actually, I, I, I'm, if you go to the Patreon, I think I'm going to have new options there because uh, uh, love your symptom. I, I'm just lately obsessed with doing the show and recording a lot of episodes, and I don't have any other choice because I feel compelled. So I want to put out a lot more content. So look for that, and you can you can help that happen. You can do uh, uh, paypal.me slash Gnostic for one-time donations. And uh, end of commercial. Uh, yeah, I, I've only done a little bit of Lacanian analysis. As I said, I want to do more. But, you know, I, I have a theological background. So a lot of what you're saying makes sense with, with some of my training in, in Gnostic theology. But also, I, I think the other two things I compare it to would be uh, kenosis and crucifixion. <laughs> because it's not always a very pleasant uh, uh, process. But you mentioned a, a word jouissance and, and primal jouissance. And, and you did sort of cover what, what that meant as, as you were just speaking. But if you could just, you know, for people not familiar with those terms, if, if you can tell us about them. Well, jouissance, this is a term that is not translated into English because Lacan... Uh, made something very specific out of it. So it is kind of a, his trademark. Uh, the whole Lacanian psychoanalysis is about jouissance. It is this kind of a, the very core, uh, the very core of Lacan's theory, but also his notion of therapy. A kind of a recovery of the primordial jouissance, as much as it is possible. That's the goal of the therapeutic action. Uh, in which the subject learns how to destitute or decreate uh, itself. So the primordial jouissance is a great joy. I mean, this is how we translate it, right? It's a great joy, it's a great bliss. Perhaps even bliss is a better term. Uh, it is something much greater than pleasure. Lacan is actually very uh, much against the pleasure principle. He connects pleasure principle with the reality principle. This is something very uh, unfreudian on, uh, on the surface. But in fact, uh, Freud claims, uh, Lacan claims that this is what Freud meant because reality principle is this order of being that is uh, organized by uh, our speech, our symbolic order. But what what goes be and uh, what goes beyond the pleasure principle is the real real, uh, which is the reality of the death drive. Mm. Something that Lacan very strongly endorses by claiming that when desire learns learns how to revert or invert and goes back from the in investment into objects on itself. This is where it learns how to uh, be in accordance with the death drive. Right? The death drive, which is there in order to question 
put into doubt and deconstruct the false world of beings and objects in it. Our eros drives us forward towards the world, so towards the spiritual investment in the world, as Jakob Kalbus would call it. But Thanatos questions eros and it sort of drives outward and wants us to pull backwards in a way into this kind of a gravitational black hole that the subject deep down constitutes uh, where there are remnants of its primordial, truly authentic jouissance. That is the joy of bliss of being just itself and nothing else, right? Not belonging to the other, not yet expropriated, not yet alienated, right? Just what Lacan calls autistic, autistic jouissance. Just me, by myself, with myself, my body, my flesh, and just joy of it. The joy of mindness. That is, I think, Lacan's obsession. This bliss of mindness that can cannot ever be felt or experienced in the world belonging to the other, where we always expropriated, that we always already, you know, not ourselves. So uh, this is Rissans. This is Rissans. Uh, and it again has an obvious Gnostic uh, associations, right? I mean, the great joy uh, of life that knows nothing but itself, knows no limitation, no death, no time, just immersed in itself and kind of an autotelic bliss of just going on, right? Um, this is exactly how the Mandeans, beloved by Jakob Kalpas, portray the great life. This is how Hans Jonas describes it in his fantastic book on the uh, ancient, the, the, the spirit of ancient Gnosis, the Gnostic religion. And this is also how Kabbalah describes the original form of the Godhead which is called Ein Sof, without limits, and which, before yet everything begins, it cannot be said that it either exists or does not exist. It is kind of a pleroma of non-being. In Hebrew, it is called metziot, which means simple presence. But yet before being and nothingness are constituted, it's just like simple presence, immersed in this joyful process of just being real and nothing else. And this great joy is called Shashua. It's indeed, that is a kind of a uh, affective side of this original plurama that is called in Kabbalah Ein Sof. So uh, when uh, Lacan talks about jouissance, uh, I think he's very much aware of all those esoteric uh, connotations, especially that when he uh, introduces the concept of jouissance uh, for the first time, he quotes uh, Paul Valéry's uh, poem, uh, The Sketch of the Serpent. Uh, which is a kind of a very, uh, a lovely little Gnostic piece uh, where the serpent, the biblical serpent in the paradise denounces uh, the kind of a false spectacle of creation and, and says that the universe is a defect in the purity of non-being. And when Lacan introduces the concept of jouissance, he says, and I quote, I am in the place when I hear voice clamoring, the universe is a defect in the purity of not being. So one cannot make it 
clearer, really. So, <laughs> so, so indeed, I mean, uh, the, also the fact that uh, in the seminar, the 20th seminar, Lacan suddenly, en passant, calls himself uh, the last Christian Kabbalist. <laughs> Uh, so the, like, additionally, additionally, uh, makes the concept of jouissance uh, like truly, uh, truly originating in those esoteric traditions. Yeah, and it's almost like Eros and Thanatos are are two pillars that that uh, sustain the uh, the the personality, and I think may also have some resonances with with Kabbalistic thought. But but mm -hmm. staying with Kabbalistic thought, so. And, and Gnostic thought. So for the scheme of the possible redemption, which Lacan envisions in his therapy, it's it's structurally almost identical to the four-stage Gnostic messianic scenario, I'm quoting you here, as imagined by Luriana Kabbalah. And, you know, this is my edition. I would say as well, it easily, easily maps onto Gnostic myths, particularly the Book of Secretron. I can take these four and, and get it onto Secretron quite easily, especially number one and number four, which I also find quite fascinating because uh, Lacan would not have been able to read Secret John. It, it didn't come. He died in 81. It wasn't really circulating in French yet. So I, this is this is sort of a, a very long question, but, but I think very important. Can you take us through these these four stages and how they line up with Lacan? And you know, I think a lot of our audience will be familiar with these four in Kabbalistic Gnostic terms. So the infinite, the contraction, the breaking of the vessels, and the return or de-alienation, if you can take us through this. Yeah, it is an incredibly complex scheme. Yes. Uh, so maybe first, uh, I'll just say a few words about how it functions within the Luriani Kabbalah, which Gershom Sholem uh, defined as the kind of a gem of the Jewish Gnosis. So um, all the associations with the earlier Gnostic texts uh, are non-accidental. Um, uh, we don't know exactly you know, how they traveled to Andalusia and then Palestine to form the Lurianic school. But it is very clear uh, that it is a kind of an amalgam, not only of the uh, earlier Jewish Gnostic influences, but also of the Christian and Islamic ones. Uh, so this kind of a, a Lurianic system, which is the late system of Kabbalah from the 16th century, indeed is a gem of Jewish Gnosis, uh, where we have uh, like four stages of creation. Uh, the first stage is pre-creational. And I already talked about it when uh, referring to the Lacan's concept of jouissance. It is the, the idea of Ein Sof as the infinite, uh, the simple presence uh, without limits that knows nothing outside of itself. And also because of that, it does not have a sense of itself. I mean, it is also without any identity. It is not a kind of a mindness that could be defined by saying, you know, it is me and this is not me, right? It is rather like in Freudian concept of primary narcissism, uh, then uh, take, taken on by Lacan, it is this initial stage of life, uh, life of the psyche, in which uh, she does not yet differentiate herself from the rest of the environment, is not aware of the existence of anything else. In that sense, we can say that uh, the uh, Lurianic in Sof is uh, consistent with what Freud and Lacan calls the first stage of human life uh, and uh, to which they refer as primary narcissism. Um, something that is lost completely once uh, the first differentiations appear, the language appears, the sense of the otherness and so on. I mean, that is what then completely overrules this primary state of uh, autoerotic and autistic joy. 
when you say autistic, you mean something like self love, not the. I, I, I use it. In, I use it in Lacanian terms. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 strictly uh, like uh, uh, like referring only to oneself, autos, right? It's like concerned only with itself, right? With no reference to anything else. Yeah. Now the second stage is symptom, and it's called contraction. Contraction, but also exteriorization. I mean, later on in Hegel, right? I mean, Hegel who was influenced by Lurianic Kabbalah indirectly by, by a Christian Kabbalah, but still calls indeed an oiserung, exteriorization. And, and this is a kind of a, a catastrophic movement in which the, uh, the, 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 the original structure of the infinite completely disappears and in a way two entities uh, appear instead of it something that will eventually learn to be god right uh, because it will gain an identity of a subject and something that will eventually shape itself as the world the material being material reality uh, that uh, also will enter a history of gaining self-consciousness. So whereas the uh, initial line self uh, is just a pure joy, uh, no knowledge, uh, no sense of otherness, uh, here a kind of a different category appears, that is the uh, uh, kind of a wish to know oneself, uh, the desire to ask the question, Elohimi, that is, who is God? <laughs> that suddenly appears, suddenly appears within itself. And once this question appears, uh, the whole catastrophe begins, right? The catastrophe of, of, of destroying uh, the original jouissance and entering the path of knowledge. Uh, Lacan is very much against it. He always thinks that it's better to be in joy than in knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, entering the path of knowledge of oneself and the other. Oneself, that is a God, as gaining self-recognition, answering the question of who am I, and the world as the other who is like a mirror necessary for the God to gain a contrast uh, with himself. Uh, William translated into the Lacanian psychoanalysis that Tsim will refer to the moment of the violent expropriation of the uh, my self into the dependence on the other. Uh, Lacan calls it a very violent act. I mean, just like Tim Tsung is in a catastrophic and, and uh, discreet, non-continuous act, quite, quite sudden, right? It's a rupture. Uh, it is the same in Lacan. It is a rupture when our self, he compares it to a globe, is suddenly pulled inside out. Pulled inside out pulled by some alien uh, point of attraction that belongs to the other. That is this kind of an image of the other with the big O who has the power to expropriate me completely. So just like in the Luriani Kabbalah, we have this moment of exteriorization when God actually uh, almost completely empties himself into the world, like right? loses all the substance. He is indeed like this cloth that is being pulled inside out. Uh, he is the same. Uh, the self, when entering the stage, the process of subjectification, of becoming a subject, uh, empties himself completely out into this dependence on the other. 
from this time, as a conscious subject, it completely loses any touch with what was before. That is this imaginary <laughs> mythological stage of unperturbed mindness. So then breaking of the vessels, the third stage, Shvirat Hakelim, which is the stage just putting things in a nutshell where the uh, elements of the divine substance uh, that are left in the world break, lose structure and mix with the matter. Uh, so what becomes of it is a kind of an entropic undifferentiated mass uh, where the sparks of the divine light and the heart shells of the material being are just mixed together. And uh, so it's a, we could say in terms of uh, nowadays physics is a state of maximal entropy <laughs> from which the universe uh, gradually tries to raise itself uh, to the state of separation, separation where these two elements uh, uh, will sort of be uh, isolated uh, from the initial gray mixture and form uh, like separate parts. So uh, in again, in Lacan, uh, that means something like dispersion of the desire. That is the moment when the self becomes completely expropriated by the other. There are some elements of the previous self, right? This mythological self from before that also are being uh, in a way sucked in into this alien universe, uh, the universe of objects the universe of other beings uh, to which they attach themselves, exactly like those sparks that attach themselves to the kernels, right, to the shells or shells, sorry, the kernels attaching themselves to the shells. Uh, and again, in Lacanian therapy, it's called the object the, ah, object little a, little autrui, meaning a little other the other of the other, the little other of the big other. It is this kind of a scattered remnants of ourselves from before. Uh, they, can, they can never be like completely separated and gathered as a whole. So the whole complete reverse here is never possible. We can never go back to the state of initial jouissance. That's lost forever. Uh, we can nonetheless reverse only so far as to recreate uh, a kind of a constellation of the sparks, the kernels, detach them from the objects. And this creates a symptom. It's like, you know, what's been left of you scattered remnants of the former you uh, dispersed through this universe of being shaped by the other and his symbolic forms. You regather it and connect it. And it's like a puzzle, right? It's like a puzzle that forms as if you, right? But in this kind of a mirror of the nebula of little objects that come together, like in an only connect uh, picture. In Kabbalah, it's called the constellation of the divine face that you reconstitute within the worldly existence. And in Lacan, it's called the symptom. It is you. Then you really, you know, uh, when you recollect all those little objects and decatect them, from the objects in being, you know, 
the erotic objects. You decaffect them thanks to the thanatos, right? The death drive allows to like de de deconnect them, right? So once you deconnect them and you recollect them and you like constellate them, you see yourself as if in a mirror. Just like the Lurianic God eventually towards the end of history sees himself in the divine constellation, right? In this divine panim, the face that is made by all the sparks reconnected. Yeah. So I know it is a very complex, as Lacan calls it, story yet, <laughs> mm -hmm. very complex narrative, but uh, indeed, uh, it makes a deep sense. And you know, uh, uh, it was actually Sigmund Freud himself uh, who made this connection between psychoanalysis and Lurianic Kabbalah. Mm. We don't know it very, we don't know it for certain, it's a kind of a rumor. Uh, but apparently uh, uh, when he was visited by Chaim Bloch, was his friend, the rabbi of Wien, Vienna. Uh, and he uh, gave him a little manuscript in, he, in which he uh, described the uh, cosmogony, cosmology of the Luriani Kabbalah. Uh, Freud apparently read it, just glanced at it, but and suddenly exclaimed, oh my God, this is gold. <laughs> so he immediately recognized, you know, the, 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 the stages of the psyche, which he himself, you know, uh, uh, started to, 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 to talk about, like a primary narcissism secondary narcissism as the beginning of the sense of I am, uh, then the birth of the object, right? The idea of the other and so on, so on. everything, he suddenly says it was there. So, uh, you know, Lacan in a way only uh, follows Freud in this happy recognition. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Well, this all seems so obvious to me, but again, I'm kind of steeped in this stuff. But but I guess, you know, mm -hmm. two questions, which is, you know, why don't more people see these, these possible links between Gnosticism and Lacan? As far as I know, there's about three scholars. You're one of them. I've had them all on the show. Um, maybe there's more mm -hmm. out there. Um, and I guess the second part of, the, of my question is, why am I going to tear out the rest of my hair when another Lacanian says to me, Gnosticism is a reinscription of paganism into Christianity. So two part, two part uh, question there. Yeah, I know it's a, the, the, the first, um, uh, the first refers obviously to Freud himself and the kind of a scientific nature of psychoanalysis. I mean, it is a great merit of Freud to have elevated uh, uh, the, the, the reflection on the unconscious, which was typical for the German Leibniz philosophy and a kind of a, which was very sort of like mysticizing, you know, philosophy of life coming from Schelling, Schopenhauer, uh, Watson Hartmann, uh, then uh, Grodek, uh, you know, all these people who, uh, who, who created a kind of a natural milieu uh, for, uh, for the psychoanalytic reflection. Uh, Freud was very much aware of it, but also tired of the kind of a uh, tacky mis New Age mysticism of this uh, uh, of this German philosophy of the unconscious. And by focusing on sexuality, uh, he just dried it up, dried the swamp, right by uh, by basically uh, destroying all this kind of a spiritual connotations and saying it's all about, it's all about sex it's all about sexual drive right and it's vicissitudes in our psyche which was a very bold move but i think the main idea of it is not was not some kind of a pansexual obsession of freud but rather this decision to turn psychoanalysis into an accountable, verifiable, falsifiable science, talking about something concrete, not some kind of a spiritual energy, you know, of Grodek or Carl Gustav Jung, 
but something as tangible as human sexuality, which then obviously turned out to be very non-tangible and weird, but at least at the beginning, that was a kind of a hard focus. So this is one of the reasons, uh, historical reasons, the decision of Freud himself to distance psychoanalysis from this morasses of the German philosophy of the unconscious, uh, uh, which uh, became even strengthened after the uh, uh, feud with Carl Gustav Jung. You know, when they fell apart, uh, Freud became even more determined to steer away from anything that he uh, that he claims to be this kind of a new agey nonsense. Talking about psychic mandalas, spiritual energies, you know, achieving a harmony and balance in psychic life. I mean, no, that he wasn't interested in that. Uh, so this is one one reason. The second is that maybe because of this. Casting and then recasting of psychoanalysis as a non New Agey uh, enterprise, Gnosticism became very wrongly associated by uh, those doing psychoanalysis with this kind of a New Agey nonsense. Mm. <laughs> like this kind of a you know, pagan thing within uh, within more advanced spiritual systems of uh, Judeo Christianity. And here, I mean, the kind of a classic case of what I call a Gnostic denial in psychoanalysis is Slavoj Žižek, who himself is Gnostic to the T. I mean, everything he says Absolutely. is just a pure Gnosis, the wisdom of the serpent. Um, the, 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 the idea of the solid hatred addressed to being as the kind of a, a revolutionary, a revolutionary uh, rejection of the worldly status quo. The praise of revolution as the Gnostic reversio to the, to the void, right, which completely decreates uh, the, uh, the given reality, both social and physical and sort of withdraws us to the void of potentialities, right? The idea of a second creation, or perhaps like in Gnosis, of stopping creation for good, right? Just reaching the void and staying there. So whatever Slavoj Žižek does is Gnostic to the T in this deeper sense of the word Gnosis, which I also detect very strongly in Lacan. But he, for some reason, which may be connected to the history of psychoanalysis itself, stubbornly defines Gnosis as this pagan, silly, new agey desire to achieve fullness and well being in life. So, this is obviously a misnomer. This is not Gnosis, right? I mean, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, even privately, I try to explain to Slava Zizek that he is like a Monsieur Jourdain from Moliere. That is, uh, he's been speaking the Gnostic prose all his life without knowing it. And it's a high time that he finally acknowledges it. But he is recalcitrant, I would say. <laughs> I, I think he might have that reputation. Um, unfortunately, we have to start wrapping up. There's so much more we could talk about. And, you know, we don't have time to get into sort of the, the gender and sex uh, aspects you discuss in your piece, which which I really wanted to because, you know, the again, the ancient Christian Gnostics are obsessed with these males who become females, these these hermaphrodite figures, uh, these, these sex changes, these differences between male and female entities. And th there's a lot to dig in there through, through the lens of Lacan. But, but I guess my last question is, uh, you know, my reading of Gnostic myth is it doesn't end in a mystical union with God. Like, we don't all become one big blob. But instead, it's, it's the creation of singular subjects. It's, it's equal gods, um, which, again, the Gnostics would say, you know, are composed of both genders, entered into a community of aeons, uh, maybe in, um, in the Kabbalistic terms, uh, uh, Sephiroth. 
Um, does this reading it in a mythological way line up with, with, with Lacan? But this is precisely where the feminine issue comes in. <laughs> yeah, okay. so get into it, yeah. I'll try to be brief. Please, I'll try please. to be brief. But uh, I, I think that, uh, that this is also something uh, that uh, Lacan is, is, very much, uh, uh, is very much appropriating from the Gnostic tradition. Yeah. But he wouldn't call it, I mean, he wouldn't go as far as theosis. I mean, that is, uh, this is something that is very strong in Ernst Bloch, right? For him, the whole subterranean Bible is actually something like a recipe for all of us human beings to become secret day that is like God. Theosis is the ultimate goal of this kind of a Gnostic wisdom of the serpent. But not for Lacan, not for Lacan. It's not so much like becoming like God. It is rather like deactivating God himself or the true God, because there's something like true God or Godhead indeed appearing in Lacan's background, especially in the 20th seminar, which is on feminine love. The true Godhead is not really a creator. It is rather like a releaser yeah. of everything that he calls by name. Actually, the the what, 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 what Lacan says uh, is uh, is that that the, this act is not exactly a creation. It is something closer to what Heidegger, uh, also very much very into the kind of a decreational kind of a nausea, uh, calls Sein Lassen, letting be. It's not exactly a creation in terms of making it and then sealing it with proprietary brand, right? I made it, this is mine, right? That is the archon. That is the wrong sense of, you know, constructing being. And this is a kind of a being that we hate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, uh, what we love is the real. And the real is this real of those singularities uh, that are allowed to enjoy their singular singular status, their mindness, right? They what the, the Isaiah calls sherit, a kind of a remnant that cannot be classified, cannot be drawn into the system of the Archon. Uh, it is not a one in the whole of parts and orders. You know, it is the remnant that can, it, it, it's just out of it. You know, it cannot be, it is this part of the globe that cannot be pulled out into the system of, of the other. It is this minus. And in, in Lacan's vision, it is indeed something like that. That's why, you know, it's like in a book of Job, which is read by Lacan, Gilbert Chesterton, and then Slavoj Žižek. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this sudden uncanny vision at the end of the book of Job, this parade of creatures, when God himself suddenly abandons the position of proud creator who owns everything he made, and somehow withdraws from the position into the position of amazement. It's like, okay, it sort of um, it emerged out of me, out of void, out of this original pleroma of non-being, but I have no control over it, right? And I don't claim any control over it. It just is and enjoys its part of being the pound of flesh that just belongs to, to each and every singular being coming one by one out of this, out of this void of letting be. So it is a very mystical vision and it is a beautiful mystical vision in which I think, you know, it's not only a, uh, 
uh, Kabbalistic messianism with this idea of the female messiah uh, engaged, but also late Heidegger, whom Lacan obviously read and admired. And also the book of Job understood as, as the kind of a the creational manifest of God himself, who steps down from the role of the creator and owner of the creation to become just this agent of letting be. Agent of letting be. According to Lacan, female sexuation, uh, as opposed to the male sexuation, is based on this nominalistic emerging of those singular creatures one by one from the void of letting be, so to say, where they are not forced to uh, gain identity, to become a part of the rational whole. That is the role of the male in Lacan. That's why a woman does not exist. But it does not mean that she's just you know, does not exist for Lacan, right? It means that she does not participate in the order of being the way that uh, male consciousness uh, is supposed to. That the female mind, female subject is allowed to, um, to hover, to sort of like, uh, uh, be somewhere else, right? In this other order of non-being, uh, the order of objects, uh, little a, you know, those sparks, those remnants of the real, uh, that is a kind of a, the world in which the woman, according to Lacan, exists. She does not exist in a sense of being in the world, of the other she does not exist for the other but because of that all the more she's real yeah exactly well uh, again uh just pure brilliance uh, i can't thank you enough uh it's been so awesome having you on the show and uh going through this with us uh so uh what i'll do is i'm going to link up uh, your books and some of the videos that you've made for university of nottingham in the show notes so people can go and find more of your work uh, i hope you'll come back on the show sometime to to talk to us about other topics do you and... i would love to i would oh, love to that, that'd be awesome i would so... love to talk about nazis and hegel <laughs> oh, oh, goodness. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, I, I, I would love that. I would love that because it, it's also it's also some something I've been on about uh, quite a bit to anybody who will listen. So uh, <laughs> anyways, OK, well, I was about to get into it, but we'll we'll save that for the future. OK, everybody, this is Deacon John signing off. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.